I uh, do come from the eastern part of Switzerland. It's uh, 820 meters above sea level, and we therefore probably have quite a lot of exposure to distal radius fractures. This is our hospital, and um, it's in a valley, and we have quite a lot of radius fractures, about 800 each year. Um, and treating operatively, we do between 230 and um, 250 each year. The history of radius fractures goes back long ago, um, since the beginning of mankind, but until 1700 it was not known that there was a radius fracture. Um, the treating physicians thought it would be a dislocation of the wrist. Um, the ancient Egyptians had special proficiencies, bone setters they were called to treat fractures, and up to 1814 when um, from Dublin, Abram Collis described this special type of fracture, which was called the um, Collis fracture. Um, this fracture was really known to mankind. And from Dublin, also Smith came, the flexion type of fracture, and these were called the Irish fractures. Um, the treatment mainly consisted of conservative treatment, and um, Mr. Collis thought that um, after some time, everything will be perfect, but and the patient will be happy, and this will not be true, um, probably. One mainstay of treatment um, for radius fractures was conservative treatment in a plaster, and from a Vienna school of uh, traumatology, they had a great history of treating them conservatively up to now, and there are certain areas in the German-speaking world where fracture treatment is mainly conservative. The main fractures occur in women. They are exposed to fractures of the distal radius six times more than men. Around 17 to 20 percent of all fractures um, of the men are fractures of the distal radius, and we see two peaks of fractures. The women are um, exposed six times more than men, and um, the men um, take up, especially in summer times and winter times, when high velocity injuries and sporting injuries come into place. And we see a second peak, which is especially in the summer months in the area where when we do not ski in the summer times, we go mountain biking and there is another peak um, for mountain bike injuries. Women are exposed much more because the quality of bone due to osteoporosis is less and it takes a man to break a distal radius. Um, it needs 285 kilograms and a woman takes only 195 kilograms to break the bone. When we look at the path mechanism, um, there is a compression of the dorsal area of the bone where the bone um, is compressed. And um, when this occurs, um, a lot of biomechanics changes in the hand and a lot of um, load will be transmitted differently to the bone. And um, we see some peaks if there is a dislocation and um, the long-term results will be um, alterated load transfer and osteo osteodegenerative changes. In this anatomical specimen, we see that falling on the outstretched hand will leave a compression on the distal radius, but not only on the distal radius, but also um, intra-articularly. If there was a Japanese study looking at intra-articular fractures, and um, mainly at the sigmoid notch, the joint to the, the ulna, in 78% of cases, this um, area is involved. Also, there is a dorsal ulna and a dorsal radial involvement of the fracture sites. Mm -hmm. And if we see a plain X-ray, we also have to look for special extensions of these fractures. Why do they occur in this area? Because um, when we look at the anatomy, we see there are some ligament origins and attachments, and where there are attachments of ligaments, the uh, bone is stronger and protected against fractures, and especially between these ligament attachments, uh, mainly these fractures do occur. 
on the one hand, <coughs> the radius is flat on the volar side, and it has a dome shape on the dorsal side. And on the dorsal side, there is a very close connection to the tendons, as we heard. And so the approach from a dorsal or palmar side are different. On the other hand, when we have a fracture of the dorsal side, um, usually there is a compression, there are much more fragments, and if we see the fracture on the volar side, we have a flat surface, we have good landmarks to have a good control of rotation. And um, in the past, as we thought, the fracture is located dorsally, we have to use a dorsal approach. And this was in the past up to 2001, our most favorite implant. We implanted those and we looked at the gaps and void of bone and we saw all the mess and it was sometimes quite difficult to rearrange the puzzle of fragments. We published um, on 1,107 radius fractures and with these P plates, um, luckily we had only 1.3% of tendon problems because um, there is a special technique to cover the plate so that the um, extensor tendons will not be hurt. On the other side, there was a, in the history, was a quite early uh, attempt to use volar plates. In 1960, the first volar plates were used, especially in Smith fractures and flexion fractures. In 1965, other buttressing plates have been described, and there was a use of these volar plates, but um, the rationale behind it was not so well known. Um, the approach, we have heard about it, is quite old. Um, 150 years ago, in old surgical books, this approach has been described. Um, the success of the VOLA approach, approach also goes along with the development of new techniques and new implants. And um, the first implants we had <coughs> were non-locking screws and plates and they can be used um, as described with this approach. Um, George Obey described also for addressing very severe intraarticular fractures to dislocate the proximal radius to rearrange the articular surface, put it back and put on a plate. Um, on the other side, the dorsal side has very less um, soft tissue coverage. On the volar side with the palmaris, um, with a um, pronator quadratus, there's much more padding and soft tissue coverage. On the one side, we see uh, the fracture, the more severe the fracture gets, the more severe is the fracture on the dorsal side. And if you have a lot of fragments in your hand, you cannot tell which belongs to which area. But on the volar side, the fracture pattern, pattern stays very much the same. If we look at the anatomy, we see on the volar side that the cortex of the radius is much thicker and the load transmission um, will be over the volar side. And usually um, the volar cortex is twice as thick, uh, thick as the dorsal um, cortex. There are some instability criteria criteria when we do an operation. If there is a dorsal angulation of more than 20 degrees, a dorsal zone of comminution, intraarticular fractures, and other things. In the past, um, people said, give me a hand of K wires and I fix you any fractures. The K wire fixation um, was very popular and sometimes is today because it's quite cheap, but um, it has some disadvantages and drawbacks. When we looked, there was a Swiss um, study in 2001, and they saw that in K-wire fixation, there is a huge amount of secondary dislocation and um, loss of reduction. Up to 2001, the Cochrane database with 3,193 fractures could not decide Probably it's good to operate on a distal radius fracture, but which kind of operation um, at that time they could not decide. There is, it goes along with the development of um, angular stable fixation systems. 
the sequence of the um, of a non-angular stable fixation is that there will be a secondary loss in the distal part but also in a proximal part if there is no angular stability there is a great risk of secondary dislocation in 2008 people thought there is now a revolution in the treatment of distal radius fractures with these angular stable implants one could see that on the one hand, in, for the American board examens, um, they saw that the number of K-wire fixations um, dropped down, while the number of internal fixations and open um, reductions um, increased markedly. On the other hand, the complication rate, which we had with the K-wires, um, dropped as well when using internal fixation. For distal radius fractures in 1995, the first angular stable implant was um, developed. This was a dorsal plate. And um, a lot of biomechanical tests have been made to compare a volar plate, a dorsal plate, and double plating. And um, during the time, it was seen that um, certainly the dorsal P plate had a good um, fracture gap um, um, resistance and um, a lot of biomechanical tests have been made, but with the advent of um, angular stable implants, there was a run for volar um, stabilizations, and um, the, soon it became very clear that K wire fixation is inferior, it cannot give adequate. Um, stability on the one hand. On the other hand, it would give a lot of irritations to tendon and nerves. Um, mechanical tests were done with using smooth packs or screws, and um, smooth packs are not as stable as screws are. And um, when using these um, locking systems, I think we will hear about it later, I don't want to talk about it. Um, then we can see a lot of different kinds of stability and all, I think on the market there are, as I know, 47 different devices for fixating the distal radius. And if you compare them for most of the fractures, um, any kind of system can be used and um, one is looking at the kind of fixation when using screws in a second and third row. This <coughs> seems to be of a great importance to have a fixation because the distal row fixates the volar part and the middle part of the radius while the proximal row um, goes um, oblique to the dorsal cortex. On the other hand, we know that um, the length of screws is very important. On the one hand, because if we have a protruding screw, the extensor tendons might be injured by the screw tip. On the other hand, the mechanical properties say that if a um, unicortical locket screw is used, 75% of the length is absolutely sufficient to produce as much stiffness as is needed for fixating the fracture. On the other hand, um, there are some screws. For example, this screw close to the fracture site, this screw is called the protection screw. When doing mechanical tests, one can see that there will be much more stiffness and stability in the fracture site and healing will be um, done, will be um, better. A lot of biomechanical tests have been done, and all these tests um, say that volar stabilization is superior, it gives more stability, it gives more ac accurate um, reduction of the fractures, and the clinical tests, randomized controlled studies, also support this belief that the clinical results concerning motion, concerning um, um, comfort for the patient are better. If we see the current state of art, we work with a biological system, the human being, and if we see plates being um, placed on the bone from a dorsal, from a volar, from a radial aspect, then um, I sometimes have the feeling, where is the biology? 
and we should think of the biology and a very recent article in 2013 said uh, that in these fractures um, with an internal dorsal spanning plate, an internal temporary aphrodisis plate, this is the state of art in complex radius fractures. I don't believe that and I think it's an overkill of um, situations. Um, quite early in the development and evolution of radius fractures, one saw the drawbacks. For example, if a plate is mounted on the bone too much distally, then um, you can see that um, it's possible that there might be tendon um, irritation or tendon attrition. And so the so-called watershed principle was um, described all plates which are placed on the bone more than distally than the um, ligament insertions, they place a great risk for tendons. And this so-called watershed line usually is respected in all modern systems. And the consequence, if you do not respect the watershed line, um, is that you cannot cover the plate with a pronata quadratus muscle on the one hand, and on the other hand, there might be tendon attritions. Um, so, on the one hand, we have to respect the biology. On the other hand, we have to respect the biomechanics and stability. And there are some um, from the 47 kinds of devices which are on the market. Um, since 2004, we have exposure to this system. Since that time, we in our unit have implanted more than 1,700 of these um, plates, and we are quite happy with that. On the other side, um, we need this stability. Stability, um, we learned about um, the quality of the bone, um, especially in women, there is osteoporosis, and the osteoporosis um, leads to a degeneration of bone quality, the trabeculars of the bone and the bone thickness um, decreases and especially under the subchondral bone um, there is a Japanese work which uh, looked at the bone quality in, um, in different levels of the bone and the um, quality of bone directly subchondrally um, stays um, up to a high age in a very good situation so that when we um, want to um, support and uh, fixate intraarticular fractures, we need a support of the articular surface because there the quality of the bone is um, up to a long period uh, very well. And it reminds me in as if there is in the mining industry, the mining industry has some protectors um, which keep up the ceiling. And in St. Gallen, in my hometown, <coughs> they have a lot of balconies. And these balconies have also the principle of angular stability. If you do not have this angular stability, there will be a loss of fixation. So when we have these fractures, there are different kinds of plate and um, that, does, um, that gives you a lot of variability. If you have a very simple extra articular fracture, then I very much like to use this frame plate because it needs a less uh, market exposure. If we have intra articular fractures, I like the situation that you can um, individually place um, all the screws because you have a freedom of choice of 30 degrees um, to place your screw on the one hand. On the other hand, in a fan-shaped um, manner, you can subchondrally support the articular surface to have a good reduction. On the other hand, especially when you do in the afternoon the workshop, you can see that um, I myself have a philosophy how to treat these fractures. I start proximally, have a coarse reduction of the fracture, fix the plate to the bone, use one screw to fix it, have an X-ray control. I almost never use um, K-wires to fix the fracture temporarily. When I have fixated the fracture proximally, I can 
introduce a screw and because the connection between screw and screwdriver is very strong i can have with a screwdriver as a lever arm a very nice possibility to address fractures and have a fine reduction so that anatomical reduction is the rule other fractures can be treated with different kinds of plates and when we have severe fractures in our um, patients, there are 65% of fractures intraarticularly, and um, nowadays we perform a CT scan. This gives us a lot of information about the special um, situation. If there is a die punch fragment in the middle, for example, and in the past we were convinced that these fractures should be treated from dorsally because you have a direct approach to the articular surface and can control even depressed fragments. But nowadays we are convinced that the majority of these fractures also can be treated from a volar approach. And as you see in this case, it was easily possible if there is a much more comminuted area, certainly the arrangement of the articular surface has priority. Um, we have quite long plates available, 9.5 centimeters or longer, um, to fix um, all these fragments. And if there is an additional fracture of the ulna, um, also on the ulna side, um, one can use special ulna plates or plates from the hand, the two millimeter systems, to give you um, adequate stabilization to allow the patient for um, good re um, rehabilitation and early rehabilitation. In situations where you have a great mess, <coughs> and um, what do you think can we do in this situation? Um, the radius is gone. The radius was substituted by a free bone graft and it was um, reconstructed and I had a video, this was not working today, but um, the results can also be very adequate. The plates are quite um, stable and in a situation where there is a secondary deformity, a malunion of the bone, um, we can use the plate um, because they are so stable to um, fix the plate in the distal part of the radius you very often have good landmarks which show you where the articular surface is and you can place the plate distally fix it distally have an osteotomy and use the plate as a lever arm to correctly uh, reduce the radius in a correct position and we have done um, quite a lot of um, reconstructions and um, um, we decided um, because the angular stable system gives you such an amount of stability that um, if there is a bone defect, a void of the bone of one, 1 1.2 centimeters, we, do, do, we usually do not use bone grafts. The gap will fill by itself and there is no loosening of the um, osteopenesis. And a lot of these osteopenesis can be done without bone grafts, especially if there is at one place a bony contact. But even if there is no bony contact um, up to 1.2 centimeters, um, we never experience any secondary loosening of the plates. If there are fractures of the distal radius, then um, and combined with fractures of the ulna, the two millimeter system gives you stabilization of the distal ulna. If we have to use conventional methods, um, tension bend fixation of the distal ulna is one opportunity, or um, special plates which are now um, available. On the other hand, we have the dorsal plate. The, um, P plate of the past was not angular stable, only with specs, and you could not freely choose the angle. Um, nowadays, we um, have to look not only to fix the radius, but to do it with less complications. And um, the placement of the plate is of a great importance. Therefore, the respect of the watershed line has superiority. 
and there were a few um, biomechanical studies placing the plate on the bone um, five millimeters more proximally or distally and when using pressure sensitive um, um, foils one could see that there is a increased pressure on the flexor tendons and this um, in another study um, gave, gave us a lot of information um, how to redesign and adapt the plates and not to um, put the tendons at greater risk of rupture. Some recent trends in the treatment of distal radius fractures are um, drawn from experiences from spine surgery where the bone can be uh, which, w when a bone is compressed, it can be lifted up with a balloon inserted in the bone, also in the tibial plateau or calcaneal fractures. This can also be used in distal radius fractures, where with a balloon, um, a depressed die punch fragment can be lifted up, and um, one possibility would be to insert bone cement. Um, this um, clinically did not prove to be very helpful. Um, another device which was used um, recently is an intramodulary expendable scaffold which can be inserted in the bone, but for intraarticular fractures um, the individual possibility to address each fragment with a screw and therefore I myself you will find there are some um, grill guide uh, blocks and devices to put in the bones in a uh, to put in the screws in a special um, modality they um, take you the freedom to insert the screws where they are needed and where the fracture dictates you where to use um, these screws this was my first introduction to talk about um, the evolution of the system a little bit later, I will be able to talk about outcome and complications. Thank you very much.